Let's go to um, uh, let's go to First John chapter one. Let's start there. Uh, I was we're teaching on uh, the basics of salvation, and in this particular part here, we were looking at how essential the word is to our salvation. The Bible, how essential it is to our salvation. If it's not the word of God, then there is not any salvation. And I've had people say, Pastor, are you sure about that? Because I know some people, they're saved, they use different Bibles. And, and I always say, look, I'm not saying I have all the answers and I'm definitely not everybody's judge. But if they're really saved, I believe God's going to bring them around. At some point, he's going to bring them around to the truth. And um, so, I'm, I mean, I just believe that's how it happens. So... Um, I, but I do believe that the Bible and belief in the word of God is basically essential for your salvation. So that's where we'll begin. Uh, let's read first John chapter one, verse one, and then I'll give you, uh, some of the things that I learned this last week or so about the Amish or the Mennonite people that you may not have, may not have known. First John chapter one, verse one, John starts out and says that which was from the beginning. You ever notice that's a pattern with John. How does he start the gospel of John? In the beginning. John likes to go all the way back to the front. That which was from the beginning, he says in first John, he says in John, in the, in the beginning was the word. But here he says that which was from the beginning, which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. Now, if you take that phrase, the word, underline that. And then if you go to the Pure Bible Search software, you type in the and then capitalize the W on word. The capital W word. If you were to take a guess how many times that exact phrase that way is in your King James Bible, how many would you say? Seven. Seven. You've got the three in first John, or excuse me, in the gospel of John, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Then you have another one in, I think, John chapter 1. And the word was, uh, became flesh and dwelt among us. Then you have this one, that which was seen from the beginning, with the word of life. Then you have 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in the heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Then you have one more after that. That's six. You have one more after that. Did anybody tell me where it is? Revelation 19. He had a name written, the word of God. And all seven of those W's in word is capitalized. Of course, they're all found. Here's what's interesting. They're all found in the New Testament. And John is the only one who wrote that that way. John is the only one who did that. So what happens if you take 1 John 5, 7 out of that? It ruins the pattern. And John has established a pattern that how he refers to Christ oftentimes is by John wrote Revelation. John wrote the three epistles of John and John wrote the gospel of John. And that's sort of John's signature is by identifying Christ with the word. He did not call him, you know, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the father, the son, the Holy Ghost. He didn't call him that. He called him the word of God. But here he says of the word of life. And then verse two, for the life was manifested and we have seen it bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested unto us. Now, on, uh, let me throw this in and I'll just tell you my little anecdotes. Ephesians two, for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, we all know that. We've known that verse probably as long as we've been saved. We've 
I know that I've heard it ever since I was a little boy here in this church. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I've heard that verse enough where I know it. I know what it means. I know, I know that it's one of the core doctrines of what we believe as Christians. And I re never forget uh, hearing Pastor Reg Kelly talk about several years ago. He was preaching. He was preaching here and he was talking about s some of the Mennonite and Amish people. And he knows several of them when we... Uh, preach down in that area sometimes we'll go seek them out my wife and I it's just something we like to do we like to visit their shops they always have some interesting items in their shops sometimes you can find a good bargain on things and and uh, so we like to support them we like to go by and see their farms and their buggies and and try to take pictures of their kids one of the funniest things we ever had happen to us one time we was preaching for uh, brother John Uter and there's some Mennonite communities uh, around where he pastors there. And we drove out there and we found one of their schools and the children were in school. And so we kind of pulled up to the school, kind of eased up to the school and pulled over to the side of the road. And as soon as we pulled our phones up, all the children dove down into the grass and pulled their hats over their heads and hid. That was the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. They don't like you to take their picture. They do not want their picture taken. The end. And we just thought that was kind of odd, you know. Um, but we like to go there. That's why we went on vacation there in Ohio to this. I, I think it's like the largest Amish or Mennonite communities in the whole country. I think it's, I think it's bigger than Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. But Reg had said in a message one time, he said, I, he said he knows a lot of Mennonites in that area. And he said they're fine as far as people is concerned. He said he likes to do business with them. He does a lot of business with them. Reg is a cattle auctioner alongside of being other things and pastoring and so on. And he's done quite a bit of business with them. They're good at making furniture. They're very hard workers. And Reg said that, you know, that's something I like. I, you know, I like for a man to be a man and, and know a day's work and go to bed real tired and get up early next morning, do it all over again. He said, that's, those are my kind of people. But he said, by and large, they're very lost. And I went, what? And he said, they are. They're very, the lost, very lost people. And he said, when it comes to salvation, their bishop tells them whether or not they're going to heaven or not. And their salvation is contingent upon what their bishop says about them rather than what the word of God says about them. Now, I did not know that at the time. So I mentioned uh, before we left that my wife and I, we started watching this documentary about these uh, Mennonite and, uh, well, Amish in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. We've been there before. And it was a BBC film crew that was interviewing a couple of young men that grew up in the Amish communities there in Lancaster County. And, you know, the different things they do, why the men don't wear a mustache, but they have to wear a beard if they're married. And why they wear the, the hat and, you know, the, 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 the brim around their hat or the band around their hat has to be a certain width. The suspenders they wear, if they wear suspenders, some don't. But if they wear suspenders, suspenders have to be a certain way. They have to either be one strand going up the back, dividing into two, or two strands in the back that crisscross in the back at a certain point. And the width of the suspenders matters. And he said their bishops get together about every six months and they determine the rules that those people are going to live by. And he said everybody has to live by the exact same rules. If you're going to be part of that particular church and they say your suspenders can be no more than two inches wide, then you better get a tape measure out and measure your suspenders because if they're more than two inches or less than two inches, that's not accepted. And while they might give you a chance to repent and get you some new suspenders, if you repeatedly break that rule, then you're a reprobate and they'll thrust you out. And here these two young men were saying... We started reading an English Bible. He said, well, you know, we have a Bible and it's written in a German dialect that none of my people understand. And he said, it's not spoken anymore. 
And he said, nobody knows what it says. And he said, most of the people haven't read it. He said, so we learned English in school. We speak English. We do a lot of business with English people. And we speak English to them. And we speak Dutch, you know, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Dutch amongst one another. But we speak English to our English neighbors. And he said, I started to read an English Bible. And I found out that 90% of what we were told we had to be in order to go to heaven was not in the Bible anywhere. So we, um, we get all the way out there. And beautiful place. I mean, beautiful place. Farms, immaculate farms. And they're out there. I mean, they're out there doing something every day. They're working. They toil. They labor from sun up to sundown. They work. And as far as good people, they're good people. I can tell you this. They like my money apparently more than I like my money. I won't get into that. A little sore subject. But anyway... So we happened upon a, a farm, and I'll tell you, if you ever want to know if you're in an Amish or a Mennonite community or not, just look at the mailbox. If it says Miller, Yoder, Troder, or Hirschberg, you're, you're there. And for some reason, there ain't no other names. Miller, Yoder, Troyer, and Hirschberg, that's it. So we're at the Hirschberg, one of the probably hundreds of Hirschberg farms. And they've got a big petting zoo there. Of course, Michaela, she was petting the little piglets and petting the goats, and feeding the, they give you a little thing of carrots to feed them. And they had this huge, biggest horse I've ever seen, big Belgian, over 3,000 pound horse. How many pound, how many hands did I say? 19, well over 19 hands, that's, that's how big this was. And they had him up on a pedestal as if he needed to be bigger. And um, then there was this uh, alpaca that they had there. And the cutest thing I've ever seen in my life. My wife wanted, she wanted, I almost bought her an alpaca. But they had a buggy. And so, Michaela, you want to ride the buggy? Yes, so... Lisa and, Lisa and Michaela got in the back seat and I got in the front seat with this man and I didn't know those horses had a reverse but those horses have a reverse that horse backed out of the stall he was in and he took us for a ride he asked us where we're we from I said Festus Missouri I said now Festus is in the Bible did you know that he said no I didn't know that I said that's a story where Paul witnessed to a man by the name of Festus and he, I said, he almost got saved. He, I said, he's, in fact, he's the man. I'm looking right at him. I said, he's the man that said, thou dost almost persuade me to be a Christian. I said, and yet he died lost. And the man said, I had never heard that before. He had never heard that story a day in his life. And we're not talking about some young pup. We're talking about, man, I think he's older than me had been an Amish man all his life, and they have church every Sunday, and he's probably never missed a service. He had never heard that story one time in his life. And there was about three or four more things that I just kind of threw out there to him that simple things from the Bible. Never heard of one of them. And I told my wife, we got done, I said, that man didn't know a Bible from that horse's backside we staring at on that, on that buggy ride. You can have a religion, and you can have a good religion. I don't have a problem with the Amish lifestyle. I don't have a problem with their mannerisms. I don't have a problem with the way, certainly with the way they dress. They're very modest people, very plain folk. I don't have a problem with any of that. What I have a problem with is assuming that, that those works get you to heaven because that is obviously what they're told. In fact, Reg said, first time I ever visited Reg Kelly's church, if my wife remembers, they had a family there. The woman still had the head covering on from the Mennonite community that they got excommunicated out of because he reported to his church that he was born again now and they tossed him. You're born again. You can't, you can't say that. How dare you say that? He said, well, I'm saying it. And they tossed him out. And they start going to Reg's church. 
So to me, it's no different than Roman Catholicism. If that bishop or if that priest or the pope tells you you're either saved or you're not saved by what you do or don't do, it's no different than a Mennonite or Amish or anybody else for that matter, you living a certain lifestyle, and I don't care how well you live it, you still have a sin nature. Guarantee you, you still have a sin nature. In fact, they gypped me, and I'm not going to get into that. I promised I wouldn't. But they have a sin nature just like everybody else does. And all of that nice clothing and all that hard work does not negate that. It does not negate that. What it does, it attempts, it, it attempts to do what Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden when they first realized they had done wrong. It is a personalized covering of their own sin. And God wouldn't accept it then and he doesn't accept it now. It takes the blood. Somebody say amen. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. The Holy Ghost says through the Apostle John, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Notice what he said. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Does it, is it important that we believe what is written as opposed to just believing what a bishop tells you? See, if that were the case, then every Amish and every Mennonite in the world is going to heaven automatically because they believe what their bishops tell them as far as salvation is concerned. So does it matter what you believe? It sure does. And that's what those young men in that in that documentary that I was watching, that's what they realized. They realized that most of the rules that they were told to live by as Amish people were not in the Word of God. They said, we don't have a problem. This is how we want to live. This is how we want to raise our children. But I'm going to raise my children and tell them, look, this is the best lifestyle in the world. But that lifestyle will not get you into heaven. You must believe what is written what is written, what is written. Over in John chapter 15, in fact, let's turn there. I know I uh, covered uh, some of this as we were, um, as so we sort of left off on this part the last Wednesday that I was here. John chapter 15 concerning the vine and the branches. Uh, Jesus was talking about, I'm the vine, you the branches. And he says in verse 3 of chapter 15, Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Well, I thought, Brother Mike, I thought it was the blood that purifies us. Yes. Well, which is it? The blood or the word? Both. You can't, and since they both stem from Jesus Christ, you can't differentiate nor separate one from the other. And then, yeah, amen, verse 7, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Now let me ask you a question. Who in here believes that verse, say amen? amen. Is there a limit to that? Because if you will abide in the word of God, you won't ask God for something that you know to be, on, to be beyond what his word allows you to have. It's like the guy uh, that I worked with years ago wanted me to pray for him because he was about to leave one wife and go get involved with the woman he was having an affair with because he justified it by saying, well, I believe this woman's really my soulmate. The first woman I married, I should have never married her. Excuse me, you want me to pray that God blesses your adulterous affair with this woman because you think this is the woman that God really wanted you to be with? I don't think so. He didn't like my answer. 
But if you'll abide in the word of God, you won't have a problem believing that God answers your prayers because you won't have a problem praying things that you know are automatically in the will of God. God used me to, God used me to witness to souls. Well, that's in the word of God. That's in the will of God. Of course, God's going to bless you to do that. In fact, you don't even have to ask. You don't have to get out on your knees and beg. You don't have to scream and cry and fast and pray all day long for it either. God just give it to you. Amen. Because it's in his will already. And when you know the Bible and you believe the Bible, then these things, you don't have to beg God for them. He just blesses them automatically. Turn to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. And by the way, I'm still recovering from vacation. If you ever have vacation, you have to recover from it. it. Takes a while. Acts chapter 11. Verse 13. This is. Um, verse 13. He had, and he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house. Which stood in said unto him, send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. This is, I believe, if I'm right, this is Peter rehearsing what has happened in Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, Cornelius had a vision that some, God's going to send somebody to his house Peter has a vision about the, the sheet being lowered down from heaven, knit at the four corners, and all types of common and unclean animals on there. And God says to him, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter three times says, I can't do that. No, nothing unclean has entered my lips. And finally God said, What I have clean, call not thou unclean. And there's a manifold teaching there. Number one. I don't believe God changes his law. God certainly didn't change the dietary laws. If God said certain animals were unclean, they're unclean unless God cleans them. And if God cleans them and purifies them, then now they're acceptable to be consumed. Because remember, we're not defiled by what goes in the body. We're defiled by what goes out of the body. But also the other teaching of that is he's referring to the Gentiles. Us unclean Gentiles. And if God wants to clean a Gentile, God can clean a Gentile pig. Amen. And that's what he's done with us. But he, he's talking about who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. We're saved by words and by believing those words. And by the way, they have to be God's words in order for us to be saved by them. Turn to back to John chapter 6. And uh, we're going to move we're going to move through this and get into a, a different topic here shortly. Is that. It wasn't you who chose God to be saved. It was God who chose you. To be saved. Who picked the animals? To go get into the ark. Who did that? God did. I guess our neighbors are wanting us to boogie woogie with them or something. That's why they're doing that. John chapter 6. Let me give you a little uh, background into this. If you look back at. Um, let's see here. Go. You're in John chapter 6. Go to um, verse 55 or verse 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Now, did not God already tell us that drinking literal blood was a no-no? So God, and since God does not contradict himself, obviously he means something different here. 
And earlier in the scriptures, he mentions the blood of grapes. Okay, and that's, that's part of what he means. But the, to drink his blood and to eat his flesh, since it cannot mean to literally drink b human blood, which God said is off limits, it must mean something different. And it does. It means the wine of the Holy Ghost, the bread of the Word of God. Being partakers of that by your soul and not your flesh. So he says, Verily I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. But we know he's not talking about literally drinking human blood. Uh, verse 56, For he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. Verse 57, As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he, uh, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. And he said, this is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. So what's he talking about? And he says in verse 59, these things said he uh, in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. And of course, the Catholic Church then has taken this. And they've made it to say that you must drink the cup we give you and you must eat the wafer that we give you because the Catholic priest has the power by saying, hocus pocus, alakazam, I've turned the juice into blood and the bread into the literal flesh of Jesus Christ. And that's what they believe. They literally believe, even though when they taste it, it tastes like wine. And the priest tells them, oh, you can't judge by that. We've turned it into the literal blood of Jesus Christ. But yet God forbade us from drinking blood. Especially in the Jerusalem Council. He forbade us from drinking blood and also from eating food sacrificed to idols, which is what they do in the Catholic Mass. They sacrifice Christ all over again in front of a statue of Christ. And they're not allowed to do that. So verse 60, many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, they said, this is in a hard saying, who can hear it? Verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, doth this offend you? Verse 62, one and if you shall hear, you shall see the son of man ascend up where he was before. It is the spirit quickeneth, that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. So there he's telling you that right there. The flesh profiteth you nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You know, just as a side note for those of you who have heard this word before, but I'm doing a lot of research on adrenochrome. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Bottom line is, there's a lot of people out there drinking blood. Human blood. It is disgusting. It is very disgusting. It's very evil. Very evil. God said don't do it. Ever. Amen. But anyway, um, verse 63, it again, he said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So think of God. God had formed Adam out of the dust of the ground and he's perfect, but he's dead. So what did it take to make him alive? God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Similarly, when you and I read the Bible and we believe it, we just believe it. He didn't say you had to understand it perfectly. He said you had to believe it. And when we read the Bible and we just believe it, 
all of a sudden God is breathing life into us. He's breathing it, but he's breathing it into our soul, not our flesh. Our flesh is dead. It's already dead. It was born dead. It was conceived dead. But our soul can live forever because we read and believe the words that Jesus said. He said, they are the spirit. And the word spirit is the word breath. It's what it means. So he says, verse 64, for there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. So let's, let's, let's pause here for just a minute. How long ago did Jesus know, Sterling, that you were going to be saved? From the beginning. From before the beginning. So if a person, if a person comes, let's say, at a revival meeting or a church service and they come down, oh, I'm so sorry for my sins, I had to cry and I want God to forgive me and and we make a big deal out of it and say, do you believe you're going to heaven now? Yes, I believe I'm going to heaven now. And yet God knows. God knows that five years down the road, ten years from down the road, he's going to be right back into the sins or even worse than he was. And he died that way. Did God know that? Sure he did. Sure God knew that. He knows it all. So it doesn't fool him. Whereas some people would say, oh, he's saved anyway. Because once saved, always saved. He's saved anyway because you can never lose your salvation. But God looks at that and says, here's what I see. I see that they never intended to begin with. To make this thing last. All they wanted to do was feel better for a while about the things they had done wrong. And I have, I have prayed with people like that before. I mean, they can fool me. I'm easy to fool. But they can't fool God. Can't fool him. So that's when he says, from that time, many of his, verse 66, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. The words of eternal life. It's the words of that save us. It's the words that keep us. It's the words that seal us. It's the words that bind us together. Just as, well, I would, I would say this 20 years ago. I'm not so sure I could say it now. But just as sure as nobody could take the DNA out of my body and rewrite it and stick it back in and make me into somebody else. Well, now we can kind of do that now. But that doesn't make me who I was born to be. Amen? That's the danger of it. Okay? But even at that, it's about the words. So, verse 69, And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? And he spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he uh, for it, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Now, Second Thessalonians chapter two. Turn there. Second Thessalonians two. By the way, I found while you're turning to Second Thessalonians two, I found something neat while I was gone on vacation. I'd never seen it before. And I'm not 100% sure what it means. I think I know what it means. But in 1 Thessalonians, I found out there's, there's, of course, there's five chapters in 1 Thessalonians. And at the end of every chapter in 1 Thessalonians, Paul mentions the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Never knew that before. Never saw that before. Never paid attention to it before. But it's at the end of chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5. All five chapters. And I was focused on, you know, 1 Thessalonians 4. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. I always focused on that one as far as 1 Thessalonians is concerned. But in chapter 1, 2, 3, and 5, along with 4, he mentions the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ or the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it means something. I'm just not 100% sure what it means yet. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. Then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him is coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth. And what is the truth? Thy word is truth. But had pleasure in unrighteousness. Why does God send them delusion? Because they didn't want to believe the Bible. It's that. Oh you, want to be, oh, you want to believe a lie? Well, buddy, if I got a big one waiting for you. In fact, I got a whopper. I've got one that is going to be so outrageous that nobody in their right mind would believe it. And you're going to believe it. That's what God says. When they just could believe the simplicity of the gospel and believe what God said. I give you one. Who believes that by everybody wearing a mask, nobody's going to get COVID? I am. I'm going to make me a screen door mask. Big window screen make a mask out of it got a, i got a face covering and if they say well that's not good enough i'll say neither is yours prove it so i'm just I, i'm i don't like being this way but i'm just i feel like bucking the tide every time they now they're going to make me wear one to go to walmart now that really ticks me off uh, James chapter 1. I mean, it might keep mosquitoes out of my mouth. The screen door mask. But I don't think it's going to keep COVID out. James chapter 1, verse 21. James said, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. That means... Lay aside all the filthy jokes. Lay aside all the filthy TV programs. Lay aside all the filthy movies, the filthy books, filthy magazines, filthy internet videos, all the naughtiness that's around. Lay that, lay that stuff aside. That's the, what Paul said, the sin that does so easily beset us. And receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Notice how he put that, engrafted word. Because our forefathers knew about grafting things long before, who was it, Gregor Mendel decided to, you teach your kids that about the... The guy that did different things with grafting, Gregor Mendel. Oh, come on, look it up. I guarantee he is in your paces somewhere. Is he in those paces? Oh, come on. Yeah. M-E-N-D-E-L, Gregor Mendel. I think he was a, a monk or something like that. That really advanced the science of grafting. To get different breeds and different hybrids out. That's God's way of doing hybrids. It's a right way. Because it involves species with species. Okay. But that's how it is. The engrafted word which is able to save your souls. And that's what Paul was talking about. When he was talking about the, the natural branch being taken out. And us the wild branches being grafted in. 
contrary to our nature. And it is contrary to our nature. That, but that's what saves us, is that we're fixed now to the righteous tree, which is Christ, which is able to save your souls. The engrafted word saves your souls. But be you doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving your own selves. That's where the faith without works part comes in. Being dead. Faith is dead. Without works, it's dead. Being alone. It cannot be alone. If you say you believe it, then I promise you it will be manifested in your works. Will be. Which is able to save your souls. But be you doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man, beholding his natural face and his glass. He's talking about a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth this way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. And here he's talking about the New Testament, not the Old. And continueth therein. He being not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. It's about getting a massive dose of the right kind of DNA injected into you. An unnatural branch contrary to living right being grafted in now is also not just receiving of the nutrients and the water that comes from the root of that tree, but it's also receiving new DNA that's compatible with the DNA that's already there. Because whose image were we made in? Do you see that now? Okay, so you can't take, from what I understand, you can't take a grapevine and graft it into an apple tree. It's not the same kind. Does that make sense? You can't take an orange branch grafted into an apple tree. It's not the same kind. But you can take one kind of apple branch grafted into a certain apple tree. That'll take because it's the same kind. This is how we who be made in the image of God can be grafted into the perfect vine of Christ because we were made in his image image and in his kind we can be grafted into that does that make sense to everybody but then to take something of a beast grafted into the divine nature it won't work because a beast nature and human natures two entirely different natures but think about how people are acting nowadays. Are they acting more like God and humans? Or are they acting more like beasts? Bada boom, bada bing. So when the beast rises up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, they're going to be joined together with that. It's going to be a perfect fit. Because that's what they're turning into. Amen? But it's, people, it's all about the word. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. He that heareth my word and believeth. No Bible, no salvation. It's that simple. No Bible, no salvation. All right. Uh, next Wednesday, we'll talk about this. Salvation's chosen and ministered by God. And not, and I'll probably talk about this again next Wednesday night. Those Amish determine whether or not you're going to heaven or not by your suspenders. Or by the, you've got a band around your hat, Sterling, that hat you wear outside, it's got a little band around it. Believe it or not, they have a rule on how wide that band can be. And if that band is wide, too wide or too narrow... You're not going. Little bitty one. You're not going. Okay? So, who determines whether you're saved? Is it a church? Is it a bishop? Is it a council? No, it's God. 
always has been God. It's never been about what man says. Very important to remember. We'll study that next week, all right?